Logic games can be intimidating, but they're very learnable. When you first start preparing for the exam, it can feel like there are countless different types of games that can be thrown your way. However, the truth is, all of the games that have appeared in the modern era can be defined in terms of just a few basic characteristics. Seven, in fact. My name is Mike Kim, and I'm the author of the LSAT Trainer. I want to talk with you a little bit about the general design of all LSAT logic games, and I also want to discuss the one skill that will most determine how well you perform on test day, your ability to diagram. Let's get started. Here's a sample game. There are four such games per logic game section. Each game presents a scenario and a set of rules that further define that scenario. Then we'll be asked five to seven questions that test our understanding of the situation that we've been given. We'll come back to this game in just a bit, but first, let's discuss the general design of all LSAT logic games. Every game that has appeared in the modern era can be thought of in terms of three main design issues. Assignment, ordering, and grouping. Again, that's assignment, ordering, and grouping. Let's break these down. Every game is about assigning elements to positions. Seven runners compete in a race. Or six friends split up into two different cars. Your diagram will always involve positions, and a list of elements. And most commonly, you'll notate assignment rules by either placing elements into these positions or crossing out the elements above or below them. About two-thirds of all games relate these positions in some sort of order. Imagine that the runner's game tells us that they finish the race one at a time. And let's imagine we're given a rule about F and G. What could they tell us? They could tell us that F finishes ahead of G, or vice versa, of course. Or maybe that F finishes right before G. Or that F finishes exactly two spots ahead of G. Or maybe there's exactly one person that finishes between F and G, but we don't know if F or G goes first. There are lots of different types of ordering rules, but they're all closely related to one another. About half of all games arrange elements into groups like the different groupings of friends that will ride in various cars, for example. We'll generally represent grouping rules vertically and mark that elements go together or don't by stacking them. Once in a while, it'll also make sense to use other types of notations, like this one on the right. So again, assignment, ordering, and grouping. This trio represents the core of what all LSAT games are about. And now we've got two categories of complications a pair of design complications, and a pair of rules complications. Let's quickly discuss them. Some games involve subsets, characteristics that further define the positions, the elements, or both. We can notate these subsets using lowercase letters. Imagine, for example, that for the runner's game, we're told that some of the runners are men and others are women. If we get a rule about a certain element being a man or a woman, or about a man or a woman finishing in a certain position, we can notate it like so. And some games involve numbers issues. These most typically appear when the number of positions is left uncertain, or when the number of positions doesn't equal the number of elements. Imagine, for example, that going back to the cars grouping game, each car can sit up to four, but there's six friends total, and we're not sure how they're going to be split up. If we get rules about which spaces get filled or not, we can notate those like so. Finally, some of the rules are complicated by being made conditional or complex. Some rules are conditional. That is, instead of just telling us that something is true, they tell us that if one thing is true, then another thing will be true. Here are some examples of conditional rules. We'll always notate conditional relationships using arrows. And finally, some rules are complex. They involve multiple components typically by using the words and or or. Here are some examples. 
Complex rules can be intimidating, but they're also often very, very useful. Let's use a simple example to illustrate why. Imagine you had this game and got this rule. Notice that by itself, this rule helps dictate three of six assignments, half the board, and commonly when it's coupled with some of the other rules of the game. The complex rule will be the most important one in terms of dictating where elements can and cannot go. Here's some of the key points that we've discussed thus far. All LSAT logic games are about assigning elements to positions. About two-thirds of all games involve ordering, and about half of all games involve grouping. Some games, like the one we're about to play, involve both ordering and grouping. The design of certain games can be further complicated by subsets and numbers issues, and rules can be complicated by being made conditional or complex. Just seven issues for you to master. And if you can learn to think about all LSAT logic games in terms of these seven conditions, it'll put you in a great position to perform at your best on test day. Now let's return to the game we saw at the beginning of the video so that we can discuss some specific diagramming and problem solving strategies. Please go ahead and pause the video if you'd like to try this on your own before seeing the solution. I think it's always a good idea to read the scenario and the rules before you start diagramming. This will help you figure out your priorities and it'll tip you off on the best way to lay out the game. In this case, we've got eight friends playing four matches of chess in order, and we can set up our base and list our elements like so. One thing I noticed in the initial read was that three of the rules involved G. So I'm going to think about and notate these rules first. And though this is a small step, I'll go ahead and notate the fourth rule right next to the first one, because I can see that those two are very closely related to one another. Next, I'll go on to the other rules and notate those as well. During the test, I probably just write in the HI notation, but if you want to include but not both to make sure you remember that, of course you should do so. And finally, it's helpful to mark the elements that haven't been mentioned in any of the rules. In addition to notating the rules, I always want to do two other things during the setup. One, look for inferences, the things that we figure out by bringing the rules together. Some games have big upfront inferences that are essential for us to uncover, and others, like this one, don't. In this case, probably the most interesting inferences are that G and M can't play in the fourth game, and K can't play in the first or second. You can notate those, but it's not essential. Two. I want to confirm that my notations are exactly correct. And I can do that by looking at each notation, saying to myself what it means, then checking my understanding back against the original text. OK, now that we've done that, let's go ahead and use our diagram to answer the question. Notice the question stem gives us new information in the form of a condition. Every time a question gives you new information, you should expect that you'll be able to make inferences off of it, and that these inferences will be what lead you to getting to the right answer. Here we're told that L plays in the third match. Looking at the rules, we can see that this also means F must play in the third match. Looking right above that FL rule, we can see that if G had played in the second match, F couldn't play in the third. That must mean G doesn't play in the second match, G plays in the first match. Now, since G and M can't play one another, and both G and M must go before K, M must play in the second match, and K must play in the fourth. We've got two open slots, and J, and either H or I, to fill them. Let's go through that one more time. If L plays in the third match, F does as well. We must place G, M, and K, and G and M must go before K. G can't go in 2 because F is in 3, so G must go in 1. M must go in 2, and K must go in 4. Now let's look at the answers. We're asked which answer could not possibly be true. That means we need the one answer that must be false. We should expect that the work we've already done makes that answer obvious. There's no reason A, B, C, or E have to be false, and D is the correct answer. There's no place for H and J to play one another. I hope that explanation was clear. 
For further discussion on some of the topics that we covered today, including a breakdown of recent LSAT logic games based on these seven characteristics, please check out my website, thelsattrainer.com. If you're ready to get started studying using the trainer methods, you can purchase the book on Amazon and hopefully in your local bookstore. We discussed at the beginning that LSAT logic games are very learnable, and I hope this video gave you the sense that that's indeed true. If you sat through this whole thing, you must be very interested in getting yourself a top score. Thank you so much for watching. I wish you the best and take care.